and uh, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker of the day, uh, and she's Agata Murka from Spark Europe, and uh, her talk is called Let's Govern Together, the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services, or SCOS for short, Community in Action for Open Science. Over to you, Agata. Hello, thank you, Rina. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, shall I just go for it, given the fact that we don't have that much time? Yes, please. Okay, so I will share my screen. Just please do let me know if this is working for you. Can you see it on your yes. screen? Perfect. Okay. Perfect. All right, so let me start then. Uh, so first of all, my name is Agata Morka. I am SCOS coordinator. And today I'm going to talk to you about governance structure that SCOS has. Um, in a recent survey that we ran uh, among the OS uh, community, it turned out that the community is quite familiar with what SCOS is, but not exactly with how SCOS operates. So I would like to um, address this question today. And talking especially um, about a matter that is especially close to our to our hearts here at SCOS, which is good governance. So SCOS, uh, first of all, let me tell you what the abbreviation means. So the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services. Um, the, this, this organization or a network uh, was established in 2017, and it is a network of uh, influential organizations from around the world who are committed to help secure um, open science infrastructure and make it sustainable. So in a, in a nutshell, what we do, we make connections between open science infrastructures in need of funding and potential pledgers within the open science community. Um, so far, we have uh, successfully run three pledging rounds. Uh, you, might, uh, you might have seen that the third round has just um, recently launched and we are promoting, uh, in this particular round, we are promoting Archive, America, Redalic, and DSpace. Um, when um, SCOS um, goes through, the, through a very meticulous process of choosing which infrastructures to include in its pledging grounds, one of the questions we ask our infrastructures is about um, their governance systems. So how do they, how are they governed? And um, we uh, also, just this year, we decided to have a look inside our own organization and um, check, um, check and update our governance structure. So what is of particular importance for us when it comes to good governance is of course transparency because we think that it builds trust. And especially in the case of SCOS, who has this role of choosing infrastructures from existing thousands of infrastructures, we choose free for each pledging round. And I think that this requires a, a huge amount of trust coming from the community. So um, we are trying to be transparent in all that we do. And of course, what is um, equally important for us is equity, diversity, and inclusion. And here in my poster, you can see how the governance structure looks like. So pretty much we have three different bodies here. So we have the SCOS board, the SCOS advisory board and the SCOS executive group. And um, all things that have to do with strategy and decision-making, that happens within the SCOS board. Um, what is also important for us is of course, to have um, a fair representation of the OS, uh, OS community. So the ways the SCOS board is organized, we have um, representatives of the open science community, meaning libraries, consortia libraries, research funding foundations, and so on. Um, we have the board, the board chair who is elected every two years. And as I mentioned, this body is uh, responsible for the future of SCOS pretty much. So we are thinking about what we want to do. We're thinking strategically in what our goals are. And uh, of course we are monitoring progress um, in terms of these strategic developments, whether we are going in the right direction. And uh, here is where, um, we're also uh, deciding on applications for funding happens. So the SCOS board is being advised actually by the SCOS advisory board. And as you can see, their main role is to, uh, to give advice, hopefully good advice. So the structure is quite similar to the SCOS board. So again, we have representatives of the OA, OS community. So we have representatives of SCOS member organizations or experts proposed by the SCOS board. And again, they're serving for two years. 
And uh, another similarity, we also have the chair of this group, so advisory board chair, also elected every two years. And the special role of the advisory board is, of course, to, to advise and to feed and to discuss expression of interest, proposing the strategic areas of funding to the SCOS board, and especially evaluating expression of interest and funding proposals that, we, um, that are coming our way for, uh, to SCOS. So um, this is more or less more of the, of the strategy slash advice part of the, of the whole process here. But when the real magic happens or when the day-to-day -day operation happens, that is actually the SCOS executive group. And um, this is the everyday operations. Um, again, the way it's organized, there is a chair um, elected every, appointed every two years by the SCOS board with representatives of SCOS member organizations or experts proposed by the SCOS board. So what is happening here and what, what, what the responsibilities of the SCOS executive groups group are? So first of all, um, this group manages both the SCOS board and, um, and the advisory group. And we are also managing funding calls and full applications, but perhaps even more importantly, we also manage communication. And I, by communications, I mean the internal communications, so between the pledgers and the infrastructures, but also the outside communication. So how SCOS is, um, is being presented to the outside world. I think that what is the most important um, in this governance structure is that we're trying to have as equitable and as diverse a representation of the open science community as possible, uh, because we are serving this community. And um, we've heard from some of the organizations that were under the SCOS umbrella, such as the OAJ, for example, that they have actually tweaked, changed their governance structures thanks to their engagement with SCOS. And I think that this is one, one of our biggest successes. So we try to practice what we preach. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agatha. And um, if you have any questions, uh, please put them um, in um, Q&A. And um, our next speaker today um, is uh, Peter Dover, but unfortunately he's having some um, connection um, issues. So let me um, show his slides. Uh, and also read from his speaker notes. Uh, uh, he's from uh, Berlin Social Science Center. Uh, and um, this presentation is about MOS Back to the Future, the OS Geo Heritage Project MOS as a best practice for geospatial community project preservation. This is a Cautionary tale from the OS Geo Heritage Project map overlay and uh, statistical system, which is MOS. Uh, in the age of having a handy digital map of whole world uh, in a pocket all the time, it's easy to forget that at some point somebody had to take first steps towards this 24 7 map availability. In times when a year old software is considered old, it's easy to skip a moment when a program dies and becomes just a faint memory of some of its users. So this fate has uh, struck the very best free digital map making uh, geographic information systems or JS software, MOOS. Uh, and uh, MOOS predates any free and off the shelf commercial uh, GIS software and um, its development started in 1977. During early 80s, MOOS had spread out from the US Fish and Wildlife Service in many other US federal agencies. Uh, development started uh, in the age of uh, mainframe computing, continued on uh, microcomputers, and ended on early personal computers running uh, Microsoft uh, DOS. But during the second half of 80s, history was uh, taking its course and new JS programs started to take over position of MOOS. Uh, at the end, apart from an entry in a JS history chapter in textbook, a copy of source code was remaining on the FTP server of the US Bureau of Land Management. Uh, MOOS was always in public domain, the code could uh, still be shared. 
since uh, 2005, uh, the Soul Cards Award for Geospatial Spatial Free and Open Source Software is awarded annually by uh, OSGEO to recognize the significance of MOOS for the open source uh, geospatial communities. Uh, and the day came when the FTDP server was gone to about uh, 2018. The MOOS code base disappeared and there was no open access preservation at that time. This is, was almost the last chapter of Moose history, but luckily, intensive search by JS enthusiasts, uh, who are authors of this presentation, uh, succeeded in a discovery of a Moose sourced code copy. A year long search and rescue effort by the Open Source uh, Geospatial Foundation led to the discovery of a surviving offline copy at the University of Latvia to preserve the Moose code base for the future, it became an OSGEO heritage project with adequate resources, project team, web pages, mailing list, GitHub repository, and most is very much alive. Uh, the PC binaries, which are now 34 years old, can still be used through those simulations, even on smartphones, which uh, outperform um, the mainframes of your. And uh, the fourth run source code can be compiled for other platforms anytime. Good news. Uh, the MOS project is uh, future proofed uh, once again, curated and long term preserved as a landmark of uh, geocomputation heritage uh, and ready for future analysis and research. Uh, we're doing this not just because of the historical significance of MOS and for the geosciences, MOS serves uh, as a well understood analog for the continuously advancing contemporary open source software projects uh, and also their software libraries, uh, which are all based on volunteer work. This work includes uh, both primary authors, but also other roles like maintainers and to give them due credit uh, in the coin of their real citation. We're busy in baby steps to explore current capabilities and push uh, for best practices for scientific software citation for the open um, geospatial communities. The most project team will report uh, emerging software citation requirements from the open science uh, domain. And thank you for your attention and apologies uh, from Peter. Uh, if you want, you, you could paste questions and I'll try to send them over Slack, uh, but that might be a little bit complicated. Uh, so I suggest that we move on and um, our next speaker will be uh, uh, Jennifer Wright and uh, Mohammed Husseini. And um, Jennifer is from Cambridge University Press and Mohammed is from Northwestern University. And they'll talk about preprint withdrawal proposing a fairly template-based approach. So over to you, Jennifer. Hi, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm just finding the right buttons here on Zoom to share my screen. Uh, has anything come through yet? Yes, uh, it's still not in a presentation mode. Is that better? Mm -hmm. Yes. So thanks for having me. It's really great to be here. This is my first force conference and it's been really fascinating so far. So thank you to everyone who's made this happen. Um, I'm Jennifer Wright and I'm here with my collaborator Mohammed Hosseini to talk to you about preprints, specifically preprint withdrawals. So I work in the scholarly communications research and development team at Cambridge University Press and I also manage our research integrity and publication ethics uh, team. So as part of this, I work on the development and operation of our open research platform, Cambridge Open Engage. And this is an interdisciplinary open research and collaboration space for preprints, but also other early research outputs. Mohammed is a postdoctoral researcher at Northwestern University's Galter Health Sciences Library, and he specializes in ethics and research integrity and has written on retractions, scholarly authorship and contributorship. So we've heard from other speakers this week about the importance of trust, of interoperability, of scholarly publishing and of open scholarly comms infrastructure. So what I'm going to talk through today on this poster, which is also available on Zenodo, is a proposal to apply these principles to not just the process of sharing research outputs, but sharing information about those outputs. Specifically, um, if readers need to know about a mistake or a problem with the output, like a retraction. 
So without intending to link everything to COVID, I think in this instance, it's fair to say that COVID has increased attention and scrutiny on the role of preprints in scholarly communication. And some of the fear and criticism that's kind of arisen as part of this discourse was the sort of disappearing preprint phenomenon. So preprints that were silently withdrawn or preprints that have clearly been removed or retracted, but with very little explanation or any at all as to why. So there's a number of, of other challenges associated with preprints that we've noticed as well, whether that's through my experience with Cambridge Open Engage or through our literature review on preprints, which you can find in our preprint, I think Mo is going to post a link in the chat to that one. So firstly, there's a lot of variation across preprint platforms and things like terminology. And in parallel, there's lots of variation in understanding amongst authors and readers of preprints, particularly across different disciplines about what preprints are and what they do. To make things even more complicated, there's variation in terms of the policy and moderation practices on preprint servers. So some are very hands on and have sort of lots of rigorous checks and policies. Others are more hands off and that could maybe be more accurately termed screening rather than moderation. And this presumably translates to retractions and withdrawals too. So who makes decisions about those and what informs those decisions? That probably varies, but it's, it's rarely transparent, so it's hard to know. And the final piece of the challenge puzzle is retractions generally. So the stigma associated with them, the often obscure language used to describe the retraction reasons, if any is given at all, and then the complexity of communicating retracted research across scholarly ecosystem and workflows. So what to do about these challenges? So we suggest an approach that provides an opportunity to apply fair principles to preprint withdrawals, a template that can be used by any author to self-retract content, and which importantly collects standardized information on the reasons, impacts, and causes of withdrawals. It also opens up the opportunity to take transparent action on situations which perhaps would ordinarily hold up decision-making about a withdrawal, things like um, unresponsive authors or legal complaints or disagreements between authors um, as to what the most appropriate action should be. So the template is on the poster here, but I appreciate it's quite hard to see. So I recommend looking at the appendix of our preprint that I think Mo is sharing in the chat. The poster also includes a flow chart for how we envisage this template being used. And we've piloted the first version of it on, on Cambridge Open Engage already. And essentially the primary use is for authors to complete the form themselves. So this could either be entirely self-reported or could be a consequence of the preprint platform passing on a concern that they've received. Once the form is completed, it can be uploaded by the author as if part of a series of preprint versions. And this would trigger the platform to carry out three tasks. So load the withdrawal template as the latest in the series, um, give it its own DOI and timestamp, trigger a metadata supply and apply whatever display on the platform is used to sort of show withdrawn content. So the process is laid out here and I'm hoping it's fairly generalizable to other open research platforms or preprint platforms. So going forward, our ambition is to iterate on this template in response to feedback from the community. So we want to carry on trialing on Cambridge Open Engage, but ultimately we want to integrate key information collected from the template into article metadata and content metadata. We'd also like to introduce the possibility to use it in a sort of withdraw and replace sense. So previous versions of content can be indicated as withdrawn, um, but if the error leading to the withdrawal can be fixed, then a new version can be uploaded. So effectively creating a, a record of versions and sort of mirroring the iterative nature of research. We hope this approach will also help tackle some of the stigma associated with retractions. Mistakes, like even the big ones, uh, are part of the process. And finally, part of the aim of the template was to improve the ability of non-specialists to understand the status of a withdrawn preprint and what that means for how it can be used. So we'd really like to get feedback from people who use preprints in this way and whether we've achieved this aim. So on that note, we'd love for you to share your thoughts too. There's a, a link that's fairly tiny on, on the poster, but you, you can find that link there. And also our Twitter handles, uh, the link has a super short survey and there's more information in the preprint. So thanks so much for your time and I look forward to hearing any questions you might have in the chat. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. Very useful and very timely. And there is a, already a question for you in a, in a Q and A from Chu. Thanks a lot. And um, I'm happy to present our next speaker who is um, Francesco Varato from uh, EPFL.
uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, and he'll talk about uh, the landscape of data repositories and platforms. Uh, over to you, Francesco. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Francesco Arato. I work as a data librarian in the PFL, the library of PFL, which is a Swiss Polytechnic University. Uh, I will start from the two main easy take takeaways of this work. Data dissemination platforms go beyond data repositories, which is not very obvious for anyone, everyone in the research community. And data dissemination practices of researchers are very diverse. So I will go through the posts a little bit, but not so much. Uh, we worked in collaboration with Charlotte Bale, a data scientist for Architecture, Civil and Environmental Engineering Department, and Maria, uh, Miriam Braskova, the Scientific Advisor for the Department of Engineering. The idea underlying our project was to uh, know which data repositories are actually really used by the, our research community and to map these solutions and to provide suggestions. It is not about discovering data sets, it's about knowing which platforms to use to disseminate data sets. The fact is that data researchers are asked to publish data sets, but they don't know where and how, essentially, most of them. And many researchers still don't know what a data repository is. And of course, even if we started from two departments, and even if we already knew many data repositories, eventually the early PFL research community has been involved. We leveraged on existing expertise from our services and from the researchers themselves, the ones at least that have some practice in data publication. For our mapping, uh, we get input uh, by uh, surveys, discussions with specific groups, and analyzing the data management plans uh, that researchers submit for review, not the final ones that are already filtered and corrected, let's say. And we gathered a lot of information. We didn't use any AI, machine learning, just a field work, very old fashioned, but in this way, we, we could focus on the results that, are, that were relevant to us. Um, was striking one thing uh, that, uh, which is also very natural if you think about it. Data researchers disseminate data not only via data repositories. It's not a shocker, but uh, data repositories really are just a fraction of the platforms that researchers use to disseminate data and code, of course. And we enlarge then the project's perspective from data repositories to data dissemination platforms. A um, lot of work has gone into structuring this information. Not only were four people around a table or a Zoom uh, with different backgrounds and uh, having to fill uh, different services to accompany these researchers, but we needed to make sure that we speak the same language and we structured this information into a spreadsheet first. And um, as you know, when it comes to online platforms, there are many nuances. Uh, it, make, it is difficult to rigidly define and categorize those platforms. In our current version, which is a work in progress that you can download uh, on Zenodo actually. So I will uh, share the link. Um, um, that, yeah, we ended up with eight main categories. Um, these sometimes overlap, of course. And uh, maybe you can use this table for your own quest in, in uh, guiding researchers in choosing the platforms in your institution. Um, for data dissemination, I want to stress it is data dissemination or just uh, data repositories. Um, what, we want, what we want to do next is to publish an improved, very simplified version of this table and a filter table in a web page because the researchers have to have access. They don't have to click and download something. They need to actually filter and already have the solution uh, to make it shorter. Probably there will be a guide because they also need guidance. The fact is that knowing a URL and the research domain, for instance, is not sufficient. The researchers want to know the maximum size of uploads, possible costs, if the repository of the platform category provides a DOI, if they can even upload in a certain platform, or if the platform has a preview feature, for instance, for some specific file formats, and so on and so forth. Uh, Retrie data focuses on um, data archives and data repositories. We, it is a very precious uh, resource, but it's not the all gray, uh, holy grail. And um, 
More importantly, the researchers from our surveys, we see the researchers want a repository or a platform that is free, that has a simple user interface, and that it's already known by their own research community, which is very difficult to have the three of them. Uh, so there is still a lot of work to do. So next step for us is to publish it uh, and um, in a better fashion and to make it evolve in an online tool uh, that helps researchers actually decide directly, uh, maybe a decisional tree or a smart, a smart filter of sort. We are going to explore different uh, ways. The final goal is to actually make the researchers independent in their choices and also to allow them to have uh, an informed choice. Thank you so much. Um, very interesting. Um, so please, if you have any questions to Francesca, post them um, in the Q&A. And um, I'm happy to present uh, our next speaker, who is uh, Delvin Franzen from Quest uh, Center for Responsible Research uh, in uh, Berlin Institute of Health at uh, Charité. And she'll talk about obtaining self-archiving permissions at scale uh, towards increasing Greenway, a case study at German University Medical Center. Um, over to you, Delvin. Thanks a lot. Um, and first of all, thanks a lot to all the organizers for setting this up. So um, as just mentioned, I'm a researcher at the Quest Center for Responsible Research at the Berlin Institute of Health at the Charité in Berlin. And I'm excited to tell you about our project on obtaining self-archiving permissions at scale. Um, and as mentioned already um, at the, in the context of university medical centers in Germany. So as um, I'm sure uh, many of you know, in many cases, uh, journal or publisher self-archiving policies allow researchers to deposit a version of their publication in a repository and sometimes with an embargo period. And this can be done to, to make a paywall publication openly available, uh, but it can also be done, of course, for publications that are already open access. Um, now, this seems pretty straightforward, but in reality, it's a bit more complicated in that self-archiving policies often define uh, several different permissions based on what version of the publication you want to deposit, so either the preprint, the accepted version, or the published version, uh, when that publication should be deposited, so often there's an embargo period, and finally, um, where um, that you want to deposit that publication. So there might be different permissions depending on if you want to deposit it in an institutional repository or a website or other. And so um, we were specifically interested in the unrealized potential of self-archiving to open up paywall publications. So there's this kind of vague notion that many paywall publications could be made open, but we were really keen on trying to quantify that a little bit more and, uh, and, and kind of generate some actionable information to, to drive change. So we explored this question in a sample of almost 2000 uh, results publications from interventional clinical trials conducted at German university medical centers and published between 2010 and 2020. And so in a first step, we extracted the open access status of these publications by querying on paywall via its API. And you can see the data for that in the first plot here. And so, of course, a publication can have several open access statuses. But in this case, we defined a uh, hierarchy such that each publication has um, only one open access status assigned to it. And what you can uh, take home from this plot is that um, at least in this sample of clinical trial publications, many are still uh, hidden behind a paywall. And so, you know, it's important for clinical trials, uh, for, in order for them to generate uh, useful and generalizable medical evidence gain, it's important that these results are, are, are open. Um, and then in a second step, we then zoomed into the paywall publications in our sample and then got self-archiving permissions for each article using Share Your Paper by OA Works. So Share Your Paper brings together publication metadata and policy information, and then to obtain self-archiving permissions at a publication level. And so while they, can, they look at self-archiving permissions, um, all, all available self-archiving permissions, they also have a best permission that specifically focuses on how can you know, this paper be self-archived in an institutional repository. And they have an API, which is great. So we 
use that to get um, the self-archiving permission for all the publications in our sample. And we focused on the best permission. And because we were also specifically interested in how to archive peer reviewed versions of publications, we further narrowed it down to the accepted or published version. And you can see the results in the plot on the right. So in essence, like what's indicated in the, the light green color is you can see that a large fraction of the paywalled publications in our sample, so to be precise, like around 86%, um, have a current best permission to archive the accepted or published version in an institutional repository. Um, so this is concrete actionable information that we hope can empower um, efforts to um, increase science discoverability. And uh, at the moment, we're actually integrating the, that data in an institutional dashboard to support the uptake of responsible research practices at an institutional level. Um, and it's also informing part of an intervention with trial lists at the Charité to increase trial transparency. So here, just jump in quickly. Um, we, we, so we're developing trial level report cards that give feedback to trial lists on the transparency of their trial, and that includes open access. Um, and then we're also combining that with hands-on guidance on, on, on how to, to increase the transparency of their trial. So in that sense, having you know, this concrete data or concrete uh, information on self-archiving is really helpful in, in driving this forward. So um, with that, that's it from my side. I want to thank you for your attention. And I'm really, really um, keen to get feedback on this or discuss any ideas you have or questions. So do feel free to get in touch. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Sarah. That's very interesting. Um, the, yeah, um, I haven't realized that uh, share your paper could be used that way as well. So thanks a lot for, for sharing it. Uh, so please, sir, uh, if you have any questions, uh, put them in a Q and A. And um, I'm happy to present uh, our next speaker, um, whom you already seen, uh, Mohammed Hosseini, and with his uh, course, uh, Christy Holmes uh, from Northwestern University. Uh, he'll talk about um, ethical research assessment with contributor roles. So over to you, Mohammed. Sir. Thank you. So I'll start sharing my screen. There it is. Excellent. So thanks everyone for uh, being here. It's a pleasure to be at FORCE again. Um, as you can see, um, I'm um, here with my colleague, Christy Holmes. Um, we are both affiliated with Northwestern University. Uh, we are based at Galter uh, Health Sciences Library in Chicago. And uh, we have a poster on uh, ethical research assessment with contributor roles. So as you can see in the poster, um, our starting point was um, DORA and DORA's recommendations. So DORA, the Declaration on Research Assessment, identifies five major stakeholders in the scholarly landscape. These stakeholders are funding agencies, individual researchers, publishers, metric suppliers, and academic institutions. Now, as you probably see, the, the poster has a lot of text, so I have summarized each section in one slide that I hope will clarify things. So um, Dora's recommendation for funding agencies is that they should consider the value and impact of all research outputs in addition to research publications. Now we believe that um, in using contributor roles as explicit criteria to evaluate research skills of grant, applica grant applicants, funding agencies can provide grant applicants an opportunity to describe their role in a project or in scholarly output. How can they do that? We think that they can develop technical solutions to import contributor roles of applicants listed publications from journals or publishers. And um, for each of our recommendations, we uh, have a kind of mini scenario where we describe um, how this could benefit the research community or researchers or uh, the stakeholder that is being talked about. In this case, the user story is about um, someone called Maria. She's a senior software developer. Um, they are the middle author of many papers, but because these authorships do not reflect their super supervision and methodology development skills, they won't get the grants that they're applying for. So then the argument follows, if 
contributor roles had been um, integrated into the um, funding agency's workflows, someone like Maria would have a better chance of acquiring the grants that they, uh, in this case, um, deserved. The second stakeholder that we discuss here are um, individual researchers. So Dora says that individual researchers should claim and give credit where credit is due. Um, we think that, well, researchers can use contributor roles to capture a wide range of contributions um, throughout the research process. How can they do that? Well, they can acknowledge specific contributions to a project or output. They can use um, solutions such as Tenzing and Rescognito for um, making sure that they capture all the um, involved tasks and contributions as they go. And again, we have a user story here. Um, our uh, protagonist in this, uh, uh, in this scenario is a, um, a patient navigator at, a, at an oncology hospital. They are often praised for their organizational and social skills in the acknowledgement section of publications. But because these um, contributions are not captured with standard roles and definitions like, um, uh, what, the, like the, what contributor roles offer, they cannot really use these statements of praise or, um, or um, acknowledgements in their resumes. The third stakeholders are publishers and um, journals. So Dora suggests that publishers should encourage responsible authorship practices and the provision of information about the specific contributions of each author. We believe that publishers can uh, integrate contributor roles into their submission systems to better contextualize the work and knowledge and the associated responsibilities. Um, how can they do that? Well, they can develop technical solutions to collect and make contributor roles available and publish works and other supplemental material. And all of these items should have a DOI, obviously, to support and support versioning if uh, it is possible. The user story that we have here is about a journal editor who's uh, really uh, trying to push for uh, making their journal um, or making their publisher integrate contributor roles. There's talks that these are kind of expensive, um, but um, we, we believe that publishers uh, have the capacity and uh, should really aim for integrating contributor roles into their submission systems. The third, supply, the third um, stakeholders are metric suppliers. Dora suggests that metric suppliers should account for the variation in article types and in different subject areas where metrics are used, aggregated, or compared. We suggest that Metrics suppliers can employ contributor roles to account for and normalize rankings based on universities' access to resources or special equipment. So, for instance, a taxonomy like credit, it has a resources um, uh, role. On that basis, if, if it is the case that metric suppliers could um, integrate contributor roles into their ranking system and into their workflows, they can normalize the, the, the rankings on that basis. How can they do that? they can employ contributor roles to account for um, those who provide resources, to those contributors who provide resources. Again, here we have a user story, um, someone who, who's a data analyst in a ranking uh, supplier organization, and they notice that a university, we called it Synergy University, is ranking unusually high among biomedical institutions. Upon further investigation, they realized that the, the, the Synergy University has just bought a state-of-the-art electron microscope, which has generated several additional publications and collaborations. So the idea here is that having access, unusual access to funding or to resources should not uh, be a, one major factor for ranking one institution a lot higher than the other ones. Um, and the last one, academic institutions. Um, so Dora suggests that academic institutions should consider the value and impact of all research outputs, including data set and software, in addition to research publications. We suggest that institutions should capture contributor roles in institutional repositories using modern key, uh, modern turnkey data management systems, such as in the new RDM. How can they do that? They can represent contributor roles in their institutional information systems and establish metadata for them. This will allow the research teams to indicate contributions across necessary materials and activities. Again, we have um, a, a, a user story here. It's a university that is distributing supplemental funds. And Baz, who's our protagonist here, um, uh, d d is uh, doing a lot of um, support work for a lot of projects, but they are not often 
um, awarded the, the, the authorship credit. So they cannot get the supplemental funds because they don't have enough publications according to, to their university's records. But because uh, we, we believe that using contributor roles would, uh, would um, enable people like Baz to get credit for their contributions and be rewarded accordingly. Um, we have a session later today called Deep Dive Ethics of Contributor Roles. Please feel free to join if you'd like to learn more about contributor roles or if you want to help us and the attribution working group in um, ensuring an ethical evolution of contributor roles. Thanks again, and I hope that you'll enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks a lot, Mohammed. Uh, very interesting and very useful suggestions. So uh, there is a question for you already in a QA. and a Excellent. And um, I'm happy to present uh, Morgan uh, Hofford, sir. And um, she's from uh, University of Michigan. Um, and she'll talk about discovering data reuse with a uh, throughput annotation database. Um, so over to you, Morgan. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction. Um, here we go. So hi, everyone. Um, I am Morgan, and I will be talking about using the throughput annotation database uh, to discover data reuse. This is a project I worked on with the collaborators listed from the University of Michigan and the University of Wisconsin. Uh, so first, I wanted to kind of give a brief overview of the throughput annotation database, which is an EarthCube funded uh, NSF project. Uh, it is a multidisciplinary graph database that connects research objects using structured annotations. These research objects include code repositories, uh, data sets and data repositories, publications, websites, grants, and other user contributed information. And then these relationships are then made public to students, data repository managers, and researchers interested in discovering new ways to analyze data across disciplines through a simple searchable interface. This slide shows the general throughput structure representing the database itself connected to several circles showing the processes used to generate the data in the database or applications built on the database. So using open APIs, throughput was populated with GitHub code repositories that reference the names or URLs of data repositories listed on re3data.org. Um, the deep dive scraper was used to discover code repositories linked to publications in the 14 million articles indexed within GeoDeepDive. And then the annotation widget allows uh, further annotation of individual data records by users. And then finally, the code codebook links re3 data sources um, and data objects to code repositories and then provides an opportunity for individuals to man manually link code repositories. And currently there are about 74,000 code repositories indexed by throughput linked to about 1,400 data resources and 19,000 journal articles. Um, as discussed, a primary role of throughput is to provide shortcuts to accessing and analyzing research data via scripts, but searching for code uh, can be really difficult. So we are trying to add metadata to code repositories based on how they use or reuse data from a data repository. Within this project, we first focused on a random sample of 129 GitHub repositories that referenced um, geology and paleontology data repositories. And we developed a typology of the reason each repository references, why each GitHub repository references uh, the data and manually coded each repository based off the typology. Um, I don't have time to get into like the typology itself, um, but as you can see here in the breakdown of the bar graph, um, a lot of the repositories were classified as using data for software development, which makes sense in GitHub. Um, others use data for um, analysis, education, and more. We believe these annotations, if applied throughout throughput, could help find users find code repositories more effectively effectively. Uh, by focusing on GitHub, we'd explore diverse uses of data resources beyond those typically quantified in some impact findings. 
uh, locating and classifying these broader uses could assist many. Um, here's some listed use cases. Uh, for instance, data repository managers identifying the impact of their repository, researchers looking for data analysis tools, software developers working on similar problems, uh, instructors building their curriculum, or students looking to learn. Uh, in the future, we hope to leverage these classification results to predict code repository type or identify useful code repositories for machine learning. Um, already, Sakura Dominguez Vidana and Simon Goring just used our small subset to create a predictive model of code repository type. Uh, the term frequency inverse document frequency model was applied to the readme text for the repositories, and initially the predictive success on the hand-labeled repositories was 66%, and they are continuing, continuing to work on this. Uh, finally, the database is accessible through an API, um, a web application, as well as a complete and open data download, um, and then all projects uh, repositories are open and free to contribute to on GitHub. Uh, I will post the links into the chat and please feel free to ask me any questions in the chat as well. Thank you all for listening. Thanks a lot, Morgan. Very interesting and exciting. Um, now I have a pleasure to invite uh, Hui Jin Wang and uh, Melody Gainey from uh, Carnegie Mellon University, and they will talk about developing metrics for assessing the impact of open science services. Um, Hi, everybody. Um, can you all see my screen? Uh, we see your screen, but not the slides. Yet. Oh, sorry. So uh, just the whole screen. Uh... <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, that's the wrong one. How about now? Yes, now it's perfect. Thanks a lot. Okay, awesome. Uh, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Hua Jin Wan, and I'm co-presenting here my, with my colleague Molly Guinea about a open science and data collaborations program uh, that we created at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries in 2018. So one thing I think that's unique about pr uh, our program is that uh, we provide end-to-end -end support throughout the entire research life cycle. So not only the end product, um, you can see from uh, this figure, uh, figure one here, uh, for the end product, we have our institutional uh, repository, Kilt Hub. But before things get there, we also have uh, lab archives, protocols.io, and open science uh, framework to support earlier stages of research documentation and sharing. Uh, we also offer workshops. Um, some of these are to teach uh, the tools we offer, and others are uh, programming and data science skills um, that uh, help people to be able to perform data analysis more reproducibly using open source languages. Um, and finally, each year we host events, hackathons, and uh, uh, data collaborations lab to facilitate uh, inter interdisciplinary collaborations and touches on all stages of life so uh, research life cycle. So now after running the program for about three years, we're at the stage of assessing program success. Um, the first method we use to do this is, uh, is uh, what, we, uh, what is called a logic model. Uh, basically, we'll list out uh, a first uh, input or resources needed for each activity. And then in the blue boxes here, you see all our activities and their corresponding outputs. So for the activities from top to bottom, uh, you have the groups of um, tools, workshop, events, collaboration, um, and outreach efforts. Um, so for the outcome, uh, we have short, uh, short, medium, long-term goals. And basically, first, we want to help researchers learn about open and reproducible workflow, then help them to adopt such practices in their daily uh, research, and eventually help them to create a cultural shift in the research community uh, across disciplines. Um, and in addition to this, we also wanna make a more quantitative assessment. So we are developing a metrics framework. We call it um, the five W's and one H framework um, because the questions we'd like to answer are like who, what, when, why, how type of questions. Uh, for example, to answer the who question, we have user affiliation and there, there's a direct metric uh, collected from uh, the dashboards or 
uh, registration records. But in order to find out who our uh, super users are, uh, we need to come up with a more a derived metric by, by combining the user information and the usage activity. So this framework is still work in progress, but we can already extract some interesting patterns. Um, you can see that uh, from on the right-hand side, um, we're able to use the integrated data to have an overview of what disciplines our departments have uh, the most number of users. And then, uh, so this is integrated from all data we have, but then for individual platforms, for example, uh, we can uh, also uh, look at uh, a tool use activity. And this box plot shows a departmental breakdown of how many public items are owned by each user on our institutional repository. And you can see that the overall me median number is pretty low, but there, there are some, what do we call the super users have higher productivity and uh, who these users are, we also was able to find out. So knowing who these super users are has been super useful for us. Um, and earlier this year, we have reached out to them and formed a advisory group uh, for open science. And we have been directly asking questions, uh, for example, why uh, they use our activities and what's their motivation. And based on these initial question uh, conversations, uh, we'd like to, for next steps, uh, design surveys and interviews that are more um, targeted to certain communities or user groups and ask more in-depth questions and answer, eventually, hopefully answer the question, how much impact we're making in the research landscape. So we're st uh, still early in our process um, of assessment and we welcome any input, feedback, collaboration and uh, partnerships. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's very useful. Uh, and there is a request in the chat if you could share a link to your poster. Oh yeah, definitely. And um, thanks a lot. And Perhaps you could stop sharing. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Just, Thank you. Uh, I just shared the link. Sorry, I only sent oh. them to the panelists at the beginning, but they're they've been sent to everybody now. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks a lot, sir. So, if you have any questions, sir, please uh, write them in a Q and A, and I'm happy to present our um, last but not the least speakers, sir, Catherine Aherm from uh, Knowledge Future Group, sir, and um, uh, she'll be with sir, her colleague, uh, Cora Korshet, sir, and uh, they will talk about benefits of uh, PRC, which stands for Publish Review Curator. So over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I believe that Cora has pasted in, yes, um, a link to our poster in Moreau. Uh, we are asking people to, um, you know, while we speak and perhaps after this event, to give us their feedback on this topic and post in these little sticky notes their questions and ideas on this topic. Um, and, and this poster is really on the growing momentum of the published review curate or PRC model um, and how we can participate and support this manner of sharing knowledge more openly and collaboratively. So it, it really is kind of a, a call to arms for lack of a better word to, um, to, to those that are interested in this who are already engaging in this type of publishing to come together because we are planning to, um, to host some, some events and, and share some information about this in the coming year. Uh, and just to go over it in the PRC model, a few key things happen that differentiate it from the current uh, more opaque, bias prone, slow model. Um, and the first thing is that authors are compelled to share their work openly and early, often on preprint servers. Second is that this early work gains the benefit of attention and feedback from the author's peers, interested scholars across disciplines and so on. Um, and third, that the authors then have the choice of improving upon it based on this open exchange and any possible new data before then making the choice themselves to either publish it again openly as a preprint or to submit it to a journal you know, openly or gated. And fourth and finally, 
the curation is democratized here and can be a domain of societies, consortia, as well as other groups and individuals. And these characteristics of PRC are key because they result in more timely knowledge sharing, iterative exchange, and learning between scholars and the more open sharing of information generally. And the pandemic brought about a sharp rise in engagement by scholars in this system. Uh, and it's, to me, it's very easy to see why when accelerating discovery became the goal of the community, early sharing of results and public commentary of latest findings proved a much, much fitter for this purpose than the traditional journal publishing system. Or do you want to pop in? Yes, I am just now. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what happened here, but I'm going to amend it just now. Uh, okay, that was unexpected growth of this um, of this poster. But let's just finish off the presentation mode, and I I'll be able to be with you momentarily. Uh, oh, okay. This was just copied over from no moved over from others. Okay. Lovely. Uh, so yes, that is true. And uh, as Catherine said, the pandemic has seen a great rise in um, in the number of um, in the number of um, preprints being deposited. Uh, in majority, those were related to COVID, but obviously they started getting traction in other uh, areas as well. But what the pandemic has also shown is the need for open review. Uh, and especially open review of those preprints, because it's one thing to have um, all those findings uh, present and available for everybody, uh, and it's another to have um, the kind of uh, quality uh, quality checks, in-depth quality checks that the peer review uh, or community review um, or community com commentary is able to provide. Um, and um, it just so happens that also in the last um, few years, especially the last five years, there's been um, a take up on, obviously it's not the majority yet, but there seems to be a trend uh, in, uh, in increasing the number of journals um, and publications that actually use open review uh, in their process to some extent. Um, and uh, some examples of um, some excellent examples of organizations who are already exemplifying working on open uh, on open peer review uh, of free prints uh, are, you know, uh, well, some have been purposely set for for the pandemic, but some have been working uh, going on for longer. Um, so we have the um, uh, we have pre review and review commons, but also uh, COVID nineteen uh, rapid reviews uh, COVID nineteen, um, and uh, also um, groups that have uh, that that. that um, can share with us uh, that can share uh, things about uh, the take of PRC model in their own disciplines and the permanence. Uh, and um, what I wanted to add to this is that uh, preprinting uh, has been embraced by the by the authors, uh, not just because it's easy to post them. <laughs> you see, the, I guess the, the 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 barrier to adoption in that sense is low. Uh, but also because they can see that there is an incentive in, in doing so. Um, and one way uh, in which that can be seen is through the citations that seem to be uh, higher for papers that have been pre-printed than, pre than those that haven't. Um, and uh, the, the other thing is that the uh, more and more funders and institutions uh, are now also accepting preprints um, as uh, as a way of, of um, establishing record or establishing priority of discovery as well, and record of productivity. Uh, so all that taken into account, uh, we can see where things are going, and clearly the way is you know with the preprints and some format of open review towards um, a full embracement of the PRC model. Uh, but what I wanted to invite everybody, well, right now, obviously, during our presentation, is to talk about the challenges. Obviously, different communities um, will feel differently about aspects of the publish, review, and curate model. So it would be great if you know everybody, um, if from their own perspective, whether it is as a researcher or as um, you know as a curator, um, would be would have would be happy to share with us their concerns or, or barriers that they see ad uh, to adopting PRC in their domain. Uh, so please um, uh, follow the link to the mirror board and uh, and drop the post-it on the poster either during the session or after. Uh, and in addition to that, you can obviously we welcome comments in the chat. 
Uh, and um, the, the last thing is what Catherine also mentioned already, uh, is that we would welcome continuing this conversation beyond just this event. So please feel free to sign up to the, uh, to the mailing list that we've set up specifically to continue the conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, thanks for setting up uh, this interactive mechanism so people could continue providing feedback after this session. And uh, apologies that you, you were the last speakers. Um, I don't see any questions or comments coming up immediately, but I, I do encourage uh, everyone to continue conversations on Slack. Uh, and um, thanks a lot for this session. Um, very interesting. Um, lots of uh, things to, to dig through and uh, read again. Uh, and um, see you at um, other first 2021 sessions and um, have a good break in between. Thank you so much. Uh, bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Good night, Michal. <laughs> Good night. Yes. Thank you. Cora, I, I, I still here because there is a question. Oh, for oh you. I am. I, I, I'm the, yeah, I'm here. There is a question for you in the chat from Giordano. Every time I speak with associate editors and above, they seem to resent a lack of reviewers. So I don't know if you want to address that and we'll have it recorded. Um, uh, yes, uh, I think that it's always a worry. Uh, I guess that's something to do with, um, with the fact that it might be more difficult to find reviewers in the open uh review model if i i'm not sure if i'm um interpreting that that correctly but i'll i'll respond to that interpretation and if i'm wrong please do send a note through uh so yes um so one of the ways in which we see um alleviating some of that kind of fear of um of reviewers not being so willing to be in to, to openly review preprints um and that's partially is from the fear of retaliation from the from the authors, I guess, uh, is that, for example, on the platform society that Elite is developing, um, we we find that it is easier for the groups to be to, to be kind of heading or facing the, um, the, the, re the reviews and the reviewers themselves for now uh, remain um, uh, can remain anonymous. Uh, in our eLife model before in the open review, we have been inviting reviewers to become, you know, we were, we were encouraging all reviewers, regardless of whether the review was kind of a positive or a negative as a result, uh, to reveal themselves. But we acknowledge that in the, in the open uh, review of preprints, I think the community's acceptance of, of the different um, types of review and different outcomes of review is not quite there. So to, to alleviate some of the fears of the reviewers, we, um, uh, at least in, in our platform, we, we, we encourage them to, to do that, to kind of review through the established groups, which can exert kind of trust, but at the same time that they kind of shield the, the reviewer from, from potential um, re retaliation if there was to be any. Thank you so much. Uh, and Jordana who asked this question is on the call. So you I hope we interpreted your question correctly. So thank you so much um, and um, see you at other sessions. Bye.